Praise God. Amen. So today, we are continuing in the Psalms and probably concluding today, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be and want. Amen. This is our fourth message in the Psalms. We have already been looking at how these precious poetic expressions are helping us in our journey with the Lord. Why are the Psalms so important? We've already touched on many of these things. Do you realize that after the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament, Psalms is the most frequently quoted Old Testament book in the New Testament? So that must mean something. See, this is the second most quoted Old Testament book. Jesus even indicated that the Psalms, the Psalms spoke about him. And Luke 24 verse 44 says, Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So that's Jesus saying that after his resurrection. On the cross of Calvary, Jesus cried out the Psalms, the words of the Psalms 22. Actually, the, if you go through Psalm 22, it's like a, a fulfilling prophecies, a lot of prophecies of, of Jesus' death on the cross. In Acts chapter 20, even the apostles quote the Psalms and use the Psalms to prove that Jesus was the Messiah. And this is something that is actually very important for us to even reinforce the fact that Psalms are so important to us. In Acts chapter 2 verse 30 says, David was a prophet, was not only a king, was not only a man of war, was not only like a singer, he was a true prophet. He spoke inspired word by the Holy Spirit. So his writing are significant for us. It is something very important. And he has spoken of the death of Jesus. He has spoken of the resurrection. It's one of the rare texts of the Old Testament prophesying the resurrection of Jesus in Psalms 110. It says, David was a prophet and knew, he knew that God had promised with an oath that he would place one of David's descendants on his throne. So this, the Psalms are very important in the early church and, and for us today. We already pointed out that Psalms use many comparisons, similes, images, metaphors, like a green olive tree. We spoke about that and the shadow of your wings. When we read in Psalms that the rivers clap their hands and the mountains sing for joy, we know it's not historical literacy, but it is uh, allegorical uh, is, is, uh, literacy. Psalms offer the most awesome illustration regarding our walk with the Lord because they use, they come and get our imaginations. It's something that out of the ordinary is not only like uh, uh, logical and everything, it, it, it is inspiring, it is different. And for instance, the, even the very first Psalm, Psalm 1, uh, says, the man or the woman who delights in the word and meditates the word, what is he compared to? A tree. What is the, the similarity of a tree and a man? There's none. But this is what we are compared to. You love Jesus, you are compared to a tree. You love the word, you are compared to a tree. There's a reason for that. And uh, the, the one of the reasons why these poetic images uh, exist for us is because they are meant to stimulate our meditation and, and force us to, to go slower and then ask ourselves the questions, why? Why a tree? What, what, what's the message? What's the meaning that I am compared to a tree? So what, what is it about? So the, these images are there to stimulate our meditation and deepen our search for the meaning of the passage. What is the writer trying to tell me in this, in this text? So that's really uh, wonderful. And someone said that we find in the, in the Psalms not only how God deals with people, but we find more uh, the people's responding to God. 
They respond to God. They express themselves to God. They complain with God. They worship God. They thank God. They declare their faith in God. They call in distress to God. So this is the people. So we're looking a lot at people and their walk with the Lord. So that's, that's important because this is describing us. We are included in, in all of these uh, sphere of emotions. It, it, we, are, we are there. We can ask an important question this morning that comes from Psalms. For who in the skies can, compare, can be compared to the Lord? Who is like the Lord our God? What is God like? Who is God to me? You know, we know a lot of facts. We are very religious, most of us have been uh, growing in a Christian culture. We, we, from our childhood, in our schools, our schools book, from our parents, we've been going to, to schools. We, you know, the Philippines, very religious country. Uh, my country is also like the Philippines, very, very Catholic country, or, or some of you have been uh, raised in Protestant environment. Or, so we know a lot of facts. We know a lot of theology about, about Jesus, about God. But this text here express a personal experience of David. The Lord is my shepherd. He's not talking about, you know, just uh, God this, God that. He's not talking, he's, this is not theology. This is personal. This is really personal. And this is what we are going to look at. The second slide here, you will see examples of metaphors or you know something like similes uh, used and I want to stress a point here they are not especially or more specifically describing the Lord they are describing the relationship that the writer has with the Lord Th think about the difference we can say yes it is describing that the Lord is a rock but who, who wrote it why did the writer wrote it? What was in his heart when he wrote it? So it's not uh, describing the Lord, just to describe the Lord. It's not a theological description, because it's not, the Lord is not a rock. You know when it says about the wings of the Lord, when it says about the, the, the eyes of the Lord, or the hands of the Lord, the, God is a spirit. But this is about how the writer perceive. This is the result of his walk with God. The personal view of God. God has become like a rock to me. God has become a refuge to me and so many experiences of my life. And so much trouble and so much stress and so much situation. He has been a shield. He has been a fortress. He has been a hiding place. He is a defense. He's, he has kept me. He's a shepherd. He's a guide. He's a light. This is me discovering that in my walk with God, God has become these things. These are comparing God to that. But this is my view or the, the writer's view to be more specific. Next slide. PowerPoint, Psalm 18, 1 and 2. David is expressing himself when he was rescued from the hand of his enemies and from the end of King Saul. I love you. Wow, this is already starting. It's not like uh, talking in the third person, like in a cold expression. Uh, he loves me or, you know, I'm thinking of him. It says, Lord, I love you. That's a spontaneous Deep personal expression. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock, and whom I take refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, play, or place of safety. And the psalm continues and saying, In my distress I call to the Lord. So what happened here? I'm, I'm calling to the Lord because... I have known, I have come to know his ability to help. Because I know his ability, I have experienced his help before. Now I can say, you are all of these things to me. Psalm 46, 1 and 2, God is our refuge and strength. A very present help and trouble. Wow. How, how would you like to have God like this? Present help. Not only present, very present help in times of troubles, any troubles. It's now. 
it's not some kind of wish in the future or some kind of vague theological uh, idea about God. It's, I have experienced that and I want to insist this morning about personal experience. Think about that. David says, the Lord is my shepherd. This is the cry of his heart. This is the discovery of his life. This is the result of his walk with the Lord. What is your declaration? What is the real relationship that you have with the Lord? What can you say this morning? The Lord is to me. What is the word? What are the words or some of the words? Of course, you can quote all of these from the Psalms because we are so knowledgeable about that. We know all of these. We can quote. But is that your terminology? Is that your heart? Is that your experience? Has the Lord been this to you so that you can see it for yourself? That's the point that I want to bring to you today. I look for someone to come and help me. We all look for help. We all wish for someone good enough to be close enough to be able to help us. I find nobody, no one will help me. No one cares. Wow, what a tragedy when someone is down to that situation. No one cares. Well, I, I hope you are not saying amen to that. <laughs> that that's, a, that's, that's so sad. Then, Wow, praise the Lord, he found somebody that cared. Then I pray to you, again, the, the you, this expression, I pray to you, Lord. You are my place of refuge. You are all I really want in life. Or the uh, more classic uh, Bible uh, version says, you are my portion in the land of the living. You are my only possession while I am here on earth. While I am on my journey here on earth, you're the only one that really matters to me. You, you're my treasure, you're, you're what counts, what makes a difference in my life. You're my portion, you're my only possession, the most important possession. What's your most important possession in your life? If there would be a, 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 a fire in your house, what would you run to make sure that it will come out? If you're married, I hope you grab your wife <laughs> and bring her out. That would reveal a lot about you. Hallelujah. Amen. We cannot study Psalms without looking more closely at uh, Psalms 23. What a wonderful Psalms. How many of you have uh, uh, memorized these Psalms before? Yeah, I, can, I think many of us. Maybe we don't all remember it right now at the moment, but we have at some point memorized it because it's so rich, it's so meaningful. A Psalm of David, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, or I will not lack anything, and we will come back to it later. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Yes, read it with me. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will feel no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I have stopped there for now, and we will see the remaining part later. This psalm is very personal. There is no we, us, or they in any lines of the Psalms. It's not about general people. It's not general facts about God. There's no, it's very personal. And these Psalms you will find he and I, me and you. The whole the vocabulary of, the, of, this, of these Psalms. Why has Psalm 23 such an impact on us? Why do we love these Psalms probably more than any other text of the Bible? No, it's a very simple reason, because as worshipers and believers in God, we hunger for this kind of relationship. That's what we wish we would have. Is that true? Hello? Yes, yes, yes you're there? Okay. The first three verses, David refers to he. He is my shepherd, he makes me to lie down, he leads me, he restores my soul. And then in verse 4, he changed from he to you. And there's a reason why this dramatic change takes place. Because if you look at the first part, it's like kind of a smooth and easy going. Uh, 
you know, lie down, green grass, peaceful water. I like to go to the water reservoir in Fanling and sit by the lake there with my Bible or walk around the lake and listen to the birds and the insects. It's a special feeling every time, I don't, I, I'm sure you are like me, when you go in pure, quiet nature, the feeling of closeness, of beauty, it reveals something of your Creator and it does us good. Is that true? Yes. yes. We all have lovers of nature. Amen. I remember one of my first contact with uh, Chinese uh, students in China. Uh, we went to uh, uh, English Corner and uh, we were talking, they were students, uh, they were teachers, um, l uh, studying to be teachers. And we were discussing in English with them. And I was describing that at one point in Canada, I, where I lived, I had no neighbors in the front. I lived in the forest. And my first neighbor on one side was one kilometer, and the other one maybe half a kilometer. And I was saying it like, this is like heaven. This is, you cannot, you cannot be better than that. This is peace. This is quiet. This is the real life. And these students were shocked. No, 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 that's not what one, because they never had this kind of experience. Living in China, in the southern part of Guangdong province, they are used to be like, you know, like a squeeze, squeeze. So, so to, to, not to have a neighbor for one kilometer on one side, that was not something they were looking forward to. But that's something, like to me, nature is so important. So the first part is like still waters, green pastures, you know, it does good to my soul, everything's cool. But then you come to the valley of the shadow of death. Wow. <laughs> then it's not he, it's you! I, Come and help me. You know, you, you understand what I'm talking about? Because the crisis of life, that's what draws us closer to God. That's where we change. You know, since we are all religious, we can all talk a lot about God. We know a lot of facts about God. But there's a difference between talking about God and talking to God. And you know, when life is easy, you're at restaurants, having a pizza with the friends, you can talk as long as you want about taking a cup of coffee at Starbucks or something. But when you are walking in the valley, you don't talk about God, you cry out to the Lord. And that's what you're doing. So the He has become you when He got to that place. And this is normal uh, human ex experience for us. So, but you can ask a question, but why should a sheep that is under the care of the shepherd doing in the valley of the shadow of death. Shouldn't it be always that near the green pastures and the, and the living water, and the you know, peaceful waters? Shouldn't it be always there? What is the sheep doing in the dangerous place and the shepherd being there as well? So it's, we, we find it uh, in the psalm. He leads me, he leads me. So it's not like a mistake of the sheep. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. God is going somewhere. And God wants you to go with him somewhere. He has a, a destination. He has a plan. And his path is a path of righteousness. And this is not no, our nature. Our nature is not a righteous one. It needs to be converted. It needs to be transformed and brought into the righteousness. So that's what the Lord is doing. He leads us into where it is necessary to be in order to grow. And it is also for His name's sake, His reputation. Do you realize that you, sheep, me, sheep, we reflect on the, on, the, uh, on the reputation of our shepherd. If I'm a bad sheep, maybe people will think that I have a bad shepherd. You, you know that? If we look at the, the children in the church here, we find many well-behaved children, and they are the pride of their parents, and every parent wish that their children will be so well-behaved. <laughs> 
because otherwise it makes them feel so uncomfortable. You don't want to take your, your child by the hand, bring them into the bathroom and because they have been impolite in front of one of your friends or church mate. So you don't want to do that. The children reflex. So the sheep reflects the shepherds. So the Lord leads us to the path of righteousness. He wants to teach us righteousness. He wants to build righteousness into us for his name's sake, for his reputation, so that when we walk and the righteousness in a manner worthy of the gospel of the calling of the one who called us from darkness to his light when we live in this way we glorify his name but when we we break the, the rules and when we we go into perversions or, or sinfulness or we we depart or we err away from the path of righteousness his namesake will also be affected by that, by our negative effect. And this is why many times the church is criticized. Not always for the good reason. Sometimes people are wrong and they just quote things that they have heard. But sometimes it is true, unfortunately. They have seen uh, scandals. They have heard about bad things happening among Christians. They have seen uh, Christians being hypocritical. And they have commented on that, and it reflects. So while the, the shepherd is leading us into the valley, there's something to learn in the valley. And also, on the other side of the valley, there are more green pasture. There are more green. So sometimes in order to get to the, the good place, the abundant life, you need to go to the dry, to the, cross the wilderness first, so that you will get on the other side. I remember years ago, we were planting trees in the Rocky Mountain and we had a big, big contract and we planted a lot, a lot of trees. And on the last day of the contract, we've been there for one month camping and tents in the Rocky Mountains, like we were going home. Then the transport that was going to bring us back broke. So, and the way to the camp geographically was very close. But by the road, it was very, very far away. So we had a choice. Walk a long, long, long way. But we were so impatient. Go down the mountain and up the mountain on the other side of the river or cross the river. But the river was not a simple river. It was a torrential river pouring down with strong current, icy water from the glaciers, and it was almost impossible to cross. So we had the choice. Either we walk the long way, or we cross in the dangerous place. So we decided to go in the dangerous place. <laughs> So we made a human chain and we hold on to each other and sometimes people would scream and the legs would float up and the, it, we could have died that day. We could have died. Praise God, he kept us. But I'm saying this, that to, sometimes we have to go through the danger in order to go to the good place on the other side. And the Lord knows what he's doing. He leads me in paths of righteousness. He restores my soul. He restored my soul, it means a return to the starting point or to the standard or the goal that is supposed to be my life, the, the, the righteousness. So it is to, to restore me from straying away from the path of righteousness, a refreshing, a restoration. When was it, now I'm asking a very serious question, when was it, when was the last time you were restored? You were truly restored to the initial state, to the closeness you have been. That moment in, in God that has impacted you so much. When did you have this, some, some kind of things like that the last time? And that's important. Let me tell you why. Many of you have heard this last few weeks about Pastor John Gibson who committed suicide at 56 years old. He was a Baptist pastor in Missouri, who was a very popular teacher, taught in a seminary in New Orleans, where he was known as a professor, a popular professor, who repaired student cars for free. Good family, good wife, children, success, pastor, teacher in seminary, 
he, and his um, hobby was to fix cars, and he liked to do it for free for the students. Nice guy. He killed himself at home on August 24. Why? What happened? A man of God, a man who knew God, a man who talked about God, a man who, who ex expressed faith and led people to go to God and trust in God. What happened to him? He needed restoration. This psalm is both restorative and preventive. And this is very important for us because it tells us something of God. When we err away, when we go in the wrong path, when we just mess up, we know it's wrong and we still do it. And we just fall into sin, fall into temptation or dishonor God or whatever it can be. These Psalms offer hope. It's not like, you know, and it doesn't say, and the shepherd take his stick and hit you on the, on the head until you bleed. He says, he restore my soul. He restores. But this pastor was not restored. What happened is that he, in his private life, he signed up into a website of adultery and uh, cheating. And then there are hackers that release details of millions who have signed up in this site. And the thought of that, he couldn't make it. The shame over his wife, his children, uh, as a pastor in the school, the reputation, he just couldn't face it. So he committed suicide. His wife, Christy, found his body with a suicide note that mentioned he talked about depression, he talked about having his name on there, and he said he was just very, very sorry. That's it. I'm very sorry. Christie says, what we know about him is that he poured out his life into other people, and he offered grace and mercy and forgiveness to everyone else. But somehow, he couldn't extend that himself to himself. The devil won. He had a shepherd, but he had a shepherd, but he was not aware. And that's the tragedy of many in the modern church today. Be careful what I'm talking to you today. There is a shepherd. We can quote it. We can, can memorize it. And we can still be as far of the shepherd as can be. This man is an example of that. A godly man with a good reputation. The shepherd existed. Is Jesus the shepherd? Yes. Well, why didn't he find the shepherd when he needed it the most? When didn't he find restoration when he needed it the most? Was restoration available? Yes. I read other articles about this. And the wife says, I would have forgiven him. And everybody else would. But he could not face it. He could not see it happening to himself. So this psalm is very important to you this morning. And I believe this is a word of warning for each and every one of us today here. There's a book in the library upstairs by Mr. McDonald called uh, Order Your Private Life. How is your private life this morning? How is your private life, your real relationship with Jesus? That's what I'm talking about this morning. Not really only com commenting on Psalm uh, 23 that means this, that means that. I'm just, this is the message that God has put on my heart this morning for His church, for Christian followers of Him. How have you been restored? When is it the last time you have been restored by the Great Shepherd? Do you need to be restored by the Great Shepherd? Have you lost your sense of dependence? Are you filled with contentment and gr gratefulness? Do you recognize the presence of the Shepherd in your daily life? Is, 
if your spirit is damaged, I give you an illustration like the Psalms. You are like a deflated ball. That's poetic, isn't it? A deflated ball. Lord, my soul is like a deflated ball. What do you do with a deflated ball? Can you play volleyball with that? Can you play soccer with a deflated ball? You cannot do anything with that. There is no will. And the will of man to make the right decision to return to righteousness, there's not this capacity, this ability to do that. Nothing can fix a broken home, a broken spirit, a broken heart, like the promises of God. I want to go to the next slide. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. That's what we need. Something that will restore, that will bring the hope that we need. Something that is alive. Something that speaks to the deepest part of our soul. And of course you see and that is more than just reading a text and being bored and yawning at the same time. It's when the, the word of God is becoming meaningful. It speaks to us. It restores. And other Bible versions says reviving, converting, restoring life. Psalm 27 verse 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. You need to experience something in order to declare that. You cannot come up with this kind of words unless you have been there. Unless you have been in the darkness. Unless you got stuck in the valley or the dark valley of, of trouble. To see that there was a light when there was no light. A light inside, that the shepherd has become a light. And what is light means here? An illumination, an enlightenment, happiness, also is part of the dictionary, and something that brightens your day when it's gloomy, when there's dark thoughts in your mind, when there's very negative things going on in your mind. Something, a light from the Lord that brightens your day, that brings some, something good, something happy that comes to you. And you know, in order to walk on the dark road, you need to have the light. And it says salvation is my light and my salvation. You actually need to have the light of revelation before you can see the opportunity of salvation. You may know the fact, but unless the light enlightens your soul, even though salvation is available, it's not going to work for you. So it all depends on the relationship, on the closeness, on the reality of a God that we sang this morning because He lives. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. Unless there is this attachment, I want to finish with New Testament. The image of the shepherd appears in the New Testament. Psalm 23 foretells the word of Jesus in John chapter 10. I am the good shepherd. And it says here, I give my life for my sheep. That's the good shepherd. That's what he does for you and me. Verse 10, chapter 10, verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep. And they know me. They hear my voice. I think that there are many of us who do not hear the voice. Even though it, the voice is there, it's not. It's like in Chinese, ting <laughs> budong. I hear the sound, but I don't hear the meaning of the, of the, of the message. Uh, and, and, and this is the, the, a tragedy for Christian to have a shepherd and not to hear, not to recognize him not to realize that what, what he can be to me. The Lord is my shepherd. Is he yours? These are the words of David. This is his unique words. This is not your words. This is his word. We love these words and we wish to have these words and we memorize these words because this is what we want to have. But this is not my word. What are your words to describe your relationship to the Lord? This is David's word. 
And this is very important that we find something like that in our own personal life because this expression has been under attack from all age by the enemy Satan. From Genesis chapter 3, he has tried to attack the reputation of the Lord, to discredit the Lord, to tell lies about who the Lord is, how the Lord is, to just you know, keep us from totally trusting in the Lord, trusting in the love of the Lord, and what the Lord, and the intention of the Lord. That's what the devil is good at doing. And that is what the Lord has done for our friend here that we, have, we were reading, Pastor John Gibson. The devil succeeded to make, to discredit the shepherd can restore him. That's a tragedy. That's a tragedy. Last verse. You will find the good things that God has in store for us. And if you want to test your relationship with the Lord, here I have a very simple uh, method for you. How many of you are married here today? Raise your hands. You, it will be easy for you. If God were your spouse, oh, <laughs> scary. If God were, were your spouse, would he be content with the quality of your communication with him? of your, the quality of your relationship with him. You know, with my wife, it's easy. <laughs> or with your husband or your wife, it's easy. People express themselves. It's just, you're not listening to me. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> my mind was busy, you know. <laughs> or, I already told you that. Oh, sorry, I didn't hear it. <laughs> Maybe you have similar experience in your home. But if God were your spouse, would God be satisfied of our relationship and our communication? That is a strange way, method to, to try to analyze ourselves, but it's very truthful. It's, you know, if you see it in terms in term like this. So this verse here tells us there is an assurance. Surely, you want God in your life. You want to stay close to God. Stay close to God. Stay close to God. Amen? Amen? Assurance, surely, goodness. And the word goodness is so encouraging in the dictionary. Good things, when I say the Hebrew dictionary, the original meaning. Good things. Bountiful things. Joyful. Gracious. Pleasant. Wealth. Prosperity. This is all included in the goodness there. Surely. Good things, a lot of good things, joyful things, grace, lots of grace, abundant grace, it's available, pleasant things, prosperity. That's the intention of God. And there's a surely that comes before that for you and I. No, because this world is all turned with the want, want, want this, want more, want centered. And here we have something different. Find the shepherd. Walk with the shepherd. Know your shepherd. Know your God as David known him. And you will feel the good things of the Lord. You will feel that. And then it says, safety. I will dwell in the house. Dwell is also a very, very funny way to express itself. It means, it's like, when you get married, it's, it's, this is in the dictionary, you can verify in the Hebrew dictionary. It's like marrying. You dwell in the house. I dwell with my wife. I'm married with her. So when we move together, we made a home. We decorate, we paint, we bought some furniture, and that has become home sweet home. That's what it means here. <laughs> it, it's truly, it's, that's what it means. Remain making a house like marrying. Surely I shall get that kind of relationship with the Lord. Like a married couple, we will make a house. We will be intimate in this house. This will be our place, our secret place, where we will enjoy one another. Amen? That's what the Lord has for us. 
and that's why it is important. The musicians are coming. We will finish with a song. As we are studying song, we will sing a, a song that you all know a classic of the classic of Christianity as the deer. But also...